Third tackle, Briley Nutty gets it off here to Lauren Brown. Lauren Brown goes herself. Loza, 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 Loza! Lauren Brown breaks it through. Third place, we're coming, Sydney Roosters, we're coming. Bing, bomb, Loza Brown slaps it right on through. 22 nilly with a kick to come. Titans are all over the Raiders today. Pack it up, Raiders. Pack it up. Yeah, g'day, Titans family, and welcome back to the Gold Coast Titans Frontline Podcast, a podcast that is focused on the Gold Coast community and our aligned goal of winning a premiership, which... We are one step closer to this week. Welcome in my co-host, Blaze from BKR Sports. Mate, we're back in the finals with our NRLW side. Great week to be a part of. How are you going? How good does it feel to be in the finals? How good does it feel to actually have like a competitive team? And this is no disrespect to our men's team, but with all due respect, we've only, you know, we had that finals appearance in 2021. We had that finals appearance in 2016. Our last finals win came back in 2010. And we're actually in the finals right now. We have one, we're one game away from potentially being the grand final. So it's a great feeling, man. You know, with the women's team, they had a really dominant performance against the Canberra Raiders, as we'll get into in a second. And, you know, uh, we're not going to really talk a great deal about uh, the uh, debatable game in the Host Plus Cup on the weekend. We will get into that one. But we don't really want to get into that one, but we will get into that one. And that's not a great vibe of a game. But overall, yeah, look, it's good to obviously be a supporter of the Gold Coast women's team right now. And uh, hopefully we crack on into the future. Yep, the women are flying the Titans flag proudly for us. Uh, we've got a, a big show today. We're going to go through all the NRLW action, preview our game against the Roosters in the finals, talk host plus cup footy, and review the season of every single one of our Gold Coast Titans forwards. Uh, let's start with our Titans news segment. Now, the RLPA Dream Team was named today. For those that aren't aware exactly what that is, it is the player's version of the Dally M medal. Dally M medal started by News Corp back in the day, so it's a media-driven award. The RLPA is actually voted on by the players themselves. Now, no Titans players got the nod in this one, Blaze. I thought Tino and Dave were a fair shout. Um, instead, AFB and Payne Haas get the prop awards, and Liam Martin and Hamoli Olakawatu get the back row awards. Now, I'm going to disagree. I think Dave was better than Liam Martin this year. He played more games, I believe. Um, do you disagree with any of those selections there? I think that... I'm okay with Tino missing out there. I love Tino. I think we all love Tino. But Payne Haas and Adam Fenor Blake, firstly, are in the preliminary finals right now and also have got unbelievable stats this year as well. So I am kind of okay with the Tino selection with Adam Fenor Blake and also Payne being above him. However, I think that Dave Fafita deserves to be over both Liam Martin and also Hamaoli Lukawatu. I think that Dave Fafita has been the best back rower in the game this season. So I'm really confused as to why uh, he's not a part of this whatsoever and how we've got nobody there because I believe that he has been the best back rower this season and has a real genuine opportunity of obviously winning, you know, a back rower team of the year at the Daly M's next week. So yeah, really disappointing there. Uh, I, I, I think the stats definitely prove a point that Dave should be there. 22 games for Dave this year, eight tries, 11 try assists. So that's almost a try involvement on average every single game. Back rowers just don't do that. Halves do. Halves, spine members, fair enough. Back rowers do not average a try or an assist every game. Um, couple that with 583 tackles at 90% efficiency and 145 average running meters. I disagree with it myself, but I can't question it too much because it is voted on specifically by the players. Um, I can't speak for the players, but I would have thought oh, I'd much rather line up against Olakowatu, who at stages is more dangerous than Dave, but I don't feel he's in the contest for the full 80. And Liam Martin, again, he is the opposite. He is in the contest for the full 80, but he probably lacks that X factor that Olakowatu and Fafita have. Um, so completely respect the players' decision to not vote for Dave there. But if I was voting myself, I would have had Dave, no questions. Uh, next bit of news, the Paul Broughton medal. I'm sure most Titans fans are aware what this is, but if you're not, it is our Titans MVP or our Titans Player of the Season award. Tino Fa'asumala Awi has won it the last two years, and if he wins tomorrow night, Wednesday, uh, he will become the first Titan in history to win it three times in a row. I want to know before the Paul Broughton medal is announced, who is your pick this year? 
Yeah, luckily enough, this is actually, for everyone listening, it's actually tonight, because we're recording on Tuesday, it'll come out on Wednesday, so this, the Paul Broughton medal is tonight, and I will be in attendance, I was lucky enough to be invited by the club there, so really looking forward to tonight, I think it's going to be a really, really good event that is going to obviously encompass the community that we're we're obviously building here. To make my selection, look, I'm going to throw out a Smokey here, an absolute Smokey, Chrissy Randall, got to throw out Chrissy Randall's name here, it's a Smokey. I think he's been incredible this season, no matter when he's been asked, no matter where he's been asked, he's just done it. He's just done what he needs to do in the front row, in the hooker, in the back row, in the lock, in the here, in the there, in the everywhere. So Chrissy Randall, absolute smoky son. But I do think that Tino is going to go back to back to back. I think Tino is the guy that obviously he holds all the stats. He is the leader of the team. You know, everyone loves him at this club and obviously has just re-signed for a very long time. So, yeah, look, I think the Tino's going to win it. But, mate, Chrissy Randall, Smokey, I'm telling you. I agree with both your selections there. Really, the only blemish on Tino's season, I would say, was that shoulder charge suspension. And I thought Jared Wallace's was worse. He got let off because he challenged it. I really wish if we could go back in time and challenge that we do. Um, that's really the only blemish on an otherwise perfect season for Tino. Um, a little bit of history about the Paul Broughton medal for our listeners. Named after the Gold Coast Titans inaugural chairman and rugby league icon, Paul Broughton, the player of the year recognizes outstanding individual playing performances round by round throughout the regular season. Uh, our co- first ever co-captain, Luke Bailey, has won it the most. He's won it three times in 2007, 2010, and 2011. Other winners have been Tino the last two years. He's looking to become equal third with Luke Bailey, but the first to win it three years in a row. Brian Kelly, Moeki Fodawaka, Jai Aro, Anthony Don, Ryan James, Lukey Douglas, great clubman there. Bo Falloon. Oh, Lukey Douglas, I love him. I love it. Saw him the other week. He's a great bloke, man. He was he was one of those kind of guys, man. I know this is completely off topic, but he was just one of those guys when the club's not going that great, he's just still powering through, man. He's just powering through. Love you, Lukey Douglas. Gee whiz. You could run that guy over with your car and he'd still play on the weekend. You could not keep that guy out of our side. He was an absolute warrior. Um, Greg Bird, Nate Miles, Luke Bailey, Nathan Friend, Preston Campbell, and uh, Anthony LaFranchi. So some really, really special names there for our club. A really, really special night. And uh, the Gold Coast Titans frontline will keep you updated on all the awards handed out. Final bit of news, just a little bit of announcement, I suppose, to our listeners. Tickets to our game at Allianz Stadium are free for members. Uh, and the game and the club, sorry, has also announced limited edition finals t-shirts that's all available through the gold coast titans website um pretty cool t-shirts if i'm absolutely honest and uh while we're with our nrlw side let's stay there let's review our massive win over the raiders 30 to 6 a great a really great game i was lucky to be there live um with my daughter uh, lauren brown actually left a comment on my post to my daughter and said um thank you for the support that means a lot from the girls which is really really awesome um feeling Solid crowd, 2,900. Majority Raiders fans. I believe uh, Kiri Oratu's mum was sitting next to me. She was very loud and vocal. She gets into it. Um, it. It wasn't a game we had to win, though. We just had to not lose by 11 or more. In the end, we threw the math book right out the window. Luckily, we did because you and I were really struggling with that last week. And we absolutely handed it to them. Uh, how did you see the game live from your YouTube? What did I tell you, man? I said the last time that there was maths involved in us getting to the top eight in the men's, we had to beat the Sharkies by, I think it was, 11 or more to actually make the finals back in 2021. No, sorry, I had to beat the the Warriors Warriors by 11 or more to go above the Sharkies. And we damn well smacked them 44 to nil, son. And we were talking about this on uh, on Messenger before the game. And I, I brought that game up. And guess what? What happened here? We had to only win by... So we, we only had to not lose by 11 this time or 12 this time. And yeah, we go out and we're going so far in front in the first 20 minutes of the game that you don't even have to think about it. Like, yeah, obviously we're streaming live on YouTube and it does get nerve-wracking because you've got opposition fans there. You know, you've got your fans there. You've got a whole bunch of different people watching on and there's a lot of pressure to to watch the game, talk to them, see what's going on and, and just really encapsulate it all. But I had no stresses. There was no worries. It was so dominant from the get-go. Ivania Politi, absolutely fantastic there. And yeah, look, it was a really, really big win for us, especially away from home. And I'll get into it in a second after you have a little bit of a, a chat yourself. 
this is going to really give us that momentum into the finals with the fact that we have gone, we're a completely different team to what we were like when we played the Roosters last time when we were at Seabus Super Stadium, we got absolutely whooped. We're a different team now. We're scoring points, and also we have one of the best defenses in the competition. We are equal, basically, with the Roosters and also the Knights there. So, you know, even the Raiders, they're only six points this game came when we took half of our girls off, you know, when we started taking our, our players off, like Ivani Politi was off, I think we put Destiny Minosinabati back to the fullback there, so, you know, and that's no negative against her, that's just that we're obviously changing up the dynamic of the team, and then the Raiders were able to score through that, but overall, very impressed with this game, I think we've really come a long way as a team, and uh, we're moving and grooving, babe, we're moving and grooving. We're actually averaging 26 points since our last loss to the Roosters, which is a, mm. a big improvement, prior to that, we had scores like 10, 8, um... 16, 17. So it's, that's a big improvement up there at uh, 26 or 27, was it? Uh, really, really, really good. Uh, we speak about the importance of early starts so often on this podcast, particularly in the NRLW as it's a 70-minute game. It becomes a, a slightly more important. And on average this year, prior to that game, we had averaged a try in the first 10 minutes in every single game. Well, how about this? It took the Raiders... 66 minutes they didn't score until the final four minutes and even then we still had the final say which was really really awesome the defense was amazing in this one uh, i love the fact that we piled three tries on the board after 12 minutes my experience the raiders nrlw crowd while smaller than what you might expect in an nrl game with only 2900 they were actually quite loud and quite vocal um and if you go back and actually watch maybe on ko um, as they come out the tunnel you'll see there's actually a lot of raiders fans doing the viking clap and I just so happen to be the only Titans fan in that part with with the flag. Um, hey, but did you do what I cool. told you to do? Did you do what I told you to do? When they're doing no, the I... clap, you got to get involved. You're just going to start screaming Titans in between their claps. That's what I did. I got on the Canberra Raiders social media doing it. And that's what you got to do, mate. You got to mess with their clap. Everyone in Canberra's got the clap. We'll mess with the clap. Mate, I love what you did. I, I don't quite have the, uh, the courage to, to do that in public, um, particularly holding my daughter and my missus. They, uh, not my missus, being next to my missus. Um, I, I don't think she would have given me a pretty evil look if I if I started yelling out um, that loudly. It's not for but the no, faint of heart, man. It's not for the faint of heart. Oh, I can tell you that right now. Uh, mate, I agree. I did a couple of vlogs and I was shaking and nervous <laughs> the whole time. So I completely respect what you're able to do there. Uh, but yeah, back to the game. Super dominant. Look, if I had to be critical, I would say from the minute 45 onwards, we kind of cruised to victory. But with finals on the horizon, in fact, we already had the game squared away. I can't hand that out as genuine criticism. You'd have to be a really um, tough marker to, to really count on that. Look, we had 50 tackle breaks in this game, seven line breaks. The Raiders, quite simply, didn't have an answer for our attack. And defensively, in this competition, as it's wrapped up, only the Roosters and Knights have conceded less than us. Uh, with six and seven respectively. Um, so this is a time where I am super excited for this club. I probably haven't been this excited in a long time, if I'm absolutely honest, if it's to do with the Titans and finals. We have a side, in my opinion, and in a lot of people's opinions, that genuinely has a chance to bring home the first ever trophy to the Gold Coast in our history of Chargers, Giants, Seagulls, it doesn't matter, in the Gold Coast history as a whole. We have a really, really good opportunity here to go on and be the first side to bring home the silverware. Uh, my final thoughts, I guess, I just couldn't be prouder of this side. And I would implore any Titans fans that are not yet tuning into our NRLW side that might tune into our NRL side, please give our side a chance in finals this week. It's a grand final qualifier. If we win, we are through to the big dance. And if you do tune in and watch our girls play, I promise it will not be me trying to convince you. They will convince you with their awesome play style. Any final thoughts from you on this game? Man, I tell you what, I was actually, my, my eyes watered up just then when you were talking about the Gold Coast and, um, you know, bringing back their first ever trophy. Like, genuinely, like, they, they, they watered up. Um, you know, it is, it is exciting, man. Obviously, you know, the uh, we, we haven't experienced a, a finals game at home uh, since 2010. Obviously, we don't get the home game here, but... The fact of the matter is, is that 2021, we kind of knew in the men's that we were sitting ducks. In 2016, we also kind of knew that we were sitting ducks. In 2010, we had some pretty good vibes about it because we were obviously a top four team. And we got that home final. So I would say that we haven't experienced this kind of excitement since 2010. However, for the true fans of the community and of this team, I would say that this is 
the most exciting part of what we've ever experienced because by 2010, we'd only been in the comp for about three, four years. Like there's no emotional, real attachment there for mine, I don't believe. Like obviously you'll have your attachment, but to be emotionally, financially, physically, and mentally invested as you are nowadays, I think that's obviously a little bit, um, I think that's obviously a little bit different there because it's just such a short time frame at that point. At this point, obviously we've gone through a lot of, time of of heartbreak and and tough moments so yeah look i think that it's a it's a fantastic time to be a titans fan obviously with the the women's game going into the finals this week and you know i I just wanted to quickly mention here as well we've scored 164 points whilst the roosters broncos and knights have all scored a lot more than us however most of our points have come in the most recent weeks so we are really starting to actually change our team quite drastically and dramatically into the team that we needed them for. Like they are scoring points now, uh, and defensively we've been really, really stout throughout the entirety of the season. So I know that you go and have a look at the points differential, and it may be massively advantageous to the Knights, to the Roosters, and to the Broncos. But we're actually one of the informed teams right now. Like we are, we are one of the form teams of the competition, and and most people won't necessarily know that because they'll just go and have a look specifically at the ladder and say, oh, well, you know, they're not that great. But you go and have a look, 30 to 6 over the Raiders, 34 to 12 over the Eels, 16 to 4 over the Tigers, and 23 to 22 over the Dragons. And then we obviously go back to the only two games we lost this year. Only two games we lost was the Roosters and the Knights. So it's exciting. We are definitely not favourites to win the entirety of the competition, but gee whiz, we're going to back them all the way. Yeah, we're not favourites. We have opened as, I'd say, significant underdogs, actually, to the Roosters, I think largely based on that round five result. Uh, But going back to finals, completely agree, man. Like, I wasn't tipping us, unfortunately, to beat the Broncos in 2016, and I wasn't tipping us to beat the Roosters uh, in 2021. Obviously, I was hoping and praying for a different result, but uh, I wasn't. I didn't have that belief that I've got this week that we can spur that upset. So it's a really, really great feeling at the moment. Let's uh, do one more recap of that game in the form of our three, two, ones, three points. I'm going to go Shaley Bent. I haven't given Shaley Bent three points this year. It's her first time. She had nine tackle breaks, 128 meters, 29 tackles for zero misses. And I just felt like she absolutely buried the Raiders on the very ground. They wish they could have signed David Fafita from, of course, her partner. But they never will because they suck. <laughs> go the Titans and go Shay Penn. She gets my three points. Who gets your three points? My three points is going to go to Avonia Polisi. I thought that from the very get go, she was clearly the player that really took it over for us. I thought that through 193 run meters from 17 runs, had 30 post contact meters, one line break, had the try, uh, which really set it in stone for me. Six tackle breaks as well. Uh, dummy half run meters also 65 there, so she's really just getting quick quick meters out of the uh, out of the middle, which is what we like to see there as well. Had to didn't have to make a great deal of tackles, but when she was asked of one, she never missed any. I think that overall she was our girl. I think that I'm very happy with her and uh, three points absolutely to Politi. I went my two points to Politi. It was actually um, a really cool moment when she scored. My two year old daughter was on the chair next to me. And um, when I started clapping, she actually started waving the little Titans 2023 membership flag, which Mm -hmm. was uh, really, really cool. And when you're at the ground, you do get a different vibe for the game to what what you go on television and you're not influenced by the commentators or anything like that. Oh, man. Commentary is something else, man. Yeah, I know what you're saying. And just every time Politi touched the ball, being around, I genuinely felt like something is about to happen here. She just gave vibes of danger every single time she touched the ball. Love watching her play. Uh, who did you give your two points to? Yeah, I'm pretty happy to give my two points to Shaylee Ben. I thought that this was her best game of the season. Did have that try, like you said, made 128 run meters. Uh, everywhere across the, the park, she was just doing everything that she needed to do. So 16 tackles, didn't miss a tackle either. Uh, no errors in the game. Uh, yeah, I thought this was her, her clear best game of the season and was a massive match. Every time she got the ball, she just looked like she was going to find a hole or she was going to take three, four defenders with her every single time. So Shaley Bent, she'll get my two points. And with my one point, I'm going to have to give it to Shana Mato. She scored a try herself. She actually got to start it off with a try in that game, which was absolutely dominant. Um, Had 16 runs for 154 metres. But to clarify here, she only played 53 minutes in this game, but that was pretty... Like, look at how many metres she's run in that short amount of time. So through 53 minutes, she has run 154 metres in this game. 
uh, with 64 post-contact meters, had the line break, had a couple tackle breaks, had 14 hit-ups in the game, which is tied most with Shaylee Bent. Um, you know, had a couple of offloads, which was great. Made 15 tackles. Unfortunately, didn't miss a few tackles. But overall, when you like I say all the time, when you're making a lot of tackles, you're probably going to miss a couple. Um, so yeah, look, I think that I think Shannon Marto was was uh, worthy of my one point. I think that from the get go, she really laid the platform. Unless you're Georgia Hale, of course. In regards to your comment there about making a lot of tackles and missing a couple, um, I actually want to get her stats up in just a moment. I, I really want to go over. Uh, exactly how many tackles she made this year for how many missed because it's unbelievable. It's something that I've never seen before. Well, they said on career. the they said on the commentary it was ninety nine point two percent tackle efficiency going into that game, and she didn't miss a tackle in this game. So I would assume that it would have to be bumped up to a ninety nine point three or four. Yeah, ninety nine point three. She made four hundred and tackles this year whilst averaging over a hundred meters per game, um, and in terms of missed tackles. She missed three tackles all year. One against the Cowboys, one against the Roosters, and one against the Eels. It's like, I, there's not even any words for that. There just isn't any words. It's like, it's it's insane. I'm actually lost for words at how dominant that is. Yeah, insane. it's ridiculous. Yeah, no, there's there's nothing that, you know, there's nothing that can compete with that. And, you know, Samima Talfa, who we had to go up against in this game, she previously was the Georgia Hale of the competition, but Georgia Hale has just absolutely come in here like a train and she's just dominating in regards to tackle efficiency. And look, there was an ineffective tackle in this game, but that's not a missed tackle. So overall, Georgia Hale is, for me, the best defender in the game and I don't think that's debatable. Yeah, I agree. I'm actually going to have to make a post about that on my page and, and maybe the the wider rugby league fan that's not as passionate about the Titans like uh, like our community is might know how dominant that is. So I'll definitely have to get a post up regarding that. Uh, my one point went to Jamie Chapman. One try, seven tackle breaks, two offloads, 118 metres. Was great in attack last week with a hat trick. Was great again this week. Um, and I just love that we've got so many options in our side. Both of our centres are dangerous. Shaylee Ben is great X Factor as well. We know what Politi's like at the back. Um, so really, really great strike all the way across the park. Let's jump into our NRLW preview this week. We're against the Roosters at Allianz Stadium Sunday, 4.15 p.m. Now, in terms of NRL, if you're an NRL fan, which you likely are, uh, there's the Friday and the Saturday, which is the prelims. And then this week in the NRLW is also prelims. The teams that finish top four will play off and the winners will will advance to the grand final next week. And it's a double header on Sunday. So it's, you know, I've seen some people... Um, saying online, oh, there's no footy anymore. It's boring without any footy. Jump into the NRLW. It's a, it's a great watch. Um, coming into this one, having lost to the Roosters exactly one month ago to the day of what we're recording right now, 30 to 8 at home to the Roosters. We now go to their home field and give them that advantage. We have opened a sizable underdogs, but based on your comments earlier in this podcast and mine, it sounds like we both believe that an upset could be on the cards here. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, look, I don't. If this was a month ago, then I think that we should be even further underdogs in this game because we weren't anywhere near as clinical as a team that we are right now. As I was speaking just before, you know, we have really scored a lot of points in our last four games, and despite the fact that our last four games has been against lower opposition, the fact of the matter is is that we've gained the momentum. We scored thirty points against the Raiders. 34 points against the Eels, 16 against the Tigers, and 23 against the Dragons. And then you go and compare that to all of our wins at the start of the season. Our largest score before that Roosters game, actually our largest score before, you know, ending up getting to the 23 points against the Dragons was 17 against the Broncos in round two. We beat the Cowboys 16-6. We beat the Broncos 17-16. Beat the Sharks 10-8. Obviously lost 22-10 to the Knights and lost 30-8 to, to the Roosters. So since then, we've then scored 23, 16, 34, and 30. So back-to-back 30-point scores. So our attack is starting to click. And I think that a lot of this is coming down to the fact that Shante Kedaratu, she's really working well alongside Lauren Brown. I think they're doing some really nice things. And Talia Fumono has been on the extended bench for a little bit now, but it just doesn't... I don't know if she's available, like available, available, or... They're just, I I don't know if she's kind of there or she is available, but they just can't select her due to the fact that they don't want to mess up this team right now because we are obviously winning games. 
Now, you go back and obviously have a look at the fact that the, the Roosters, in their recent weeks, they beat the Cowboys 4-16, but the Cowboys pushed them for the first half until an absolute brain explosion at the end of the first half there. Lost to the Knights 20-4. to That was a big one. Losing to the Knights 20-4 was something that really shows that the Roosters are definitely still a beatable team. But I tell you what, the scary thing is their attack. 46-12 against the Eels, 48-10 against the Tigers. Obviously beat us 30-8, beat the Sharks 36-12, beat the Dragons 30-0. Uh, lost to the Raiders, funnily enough, 24-14, and beat the Broncos 36-18 back in round one. So this attack of the Roosters is the scary thing. Uh, and their defense is usually quite solid. However, the Cowboys rubber put 16 points past them this week. We've really turned a, a, a new leaf. I think that we've got a really good opportunity to, to sneak this one. And I feel like everyone's writing us off who isn't a Titans fan. So that's just got, yeah, absolutely. Upset on the cards, potential. It just adds fuel to the fire for the players, the fans, everyone involved in our club. Um, no well, one have, like, sorry to interrupt you, but it's like the Storm right now against the Panthers, right? Like everyone's saying the Storm can't beat the Panthers. Well, guess what? It wouldn't surprise me if Cameron Munster, Harry Grant and the likes find a way to beat the Panthers just because everyone's saying they can't. And people are saying the same thing about the Titans women's right now against the Roosters, the same Roosters who have lost to the Raiders and has also lost to the Knights this season. So it is a doable uh, achievement to actually... Uh, get a win against them. Completely agree. And you often hear the saying that finals is a new ball game or it's a new competition. You hear that mostly in the NRL, which is a 26 round, 27 round season rather. Well, the NRLW, why, why would the same not apply there? I believe it does. The key difference for me, it's a nine game season. So our players are fresher than they would be in the NRL uh, version of that saying. Look, it's certainly a tough game. We can't look past that. Potentially our toughest of the season. Last time we played them, Nothing went right for us. Uh, we still had our young halves pairing of Kiriaratu and Lafipo in the halves. And we've now seen that we're, we're a different uh, team with Lauren Brown there at seven steering the ship. They scored in the opening minute. Um, so it was just a game where just nothing went to plan for us. And I truly think we can right some wrongs in this contest. I tried to look for advantages they might have across the park. They are honestly so stacked. They have so many rep players. Like people say the Roosters NRL sides over the salary cap. Well, if people truly believe that, the NRLW side isn't far behind. <laughs> they are absolutely stacked. It's, a, it, absolutely. it's ridiculous, if I'm honest. Um, I guess the advantage for us, Jessica Sergis is not expected to return. Um, I need to check team list. She is as the, she's on the extended reserves, though. Okay. So in the same uh, the same field as Fumano there, where she might return. Mm. Uh, I'll be absolutely honest and transparent here. I think right now... I must make the decision. Who are you going to tip in this game head to head? I probably would have to say the Roosters, but I'm not going to. That's it. if I absolutely had to make the call. How dare you? Disgrace. No, well, the, Gee whiz. Let, me, let me clear that up because there is a big part of me, and perhaps it's optimistic, but I think we can catch the Roosters off guard here. I just think back to last year in the finals. Now, they won the NRLW in 2021. That was kind of their moment in the sun. Like, that's when they got all their stars there the Surgises, the Isabel Kellys, et cetera. Flashback to last year, this corresponding game in the 2022 NRLW season, the Eels. They won one game all season. It was the final round, and they qualified for finals because of that. They then beat the Roosters at the Roosters' home by 14 points. So you're telling me that if the Eels can do it last year with the form of winning one game, and we can come into this one with similar form to the Roosters, that we can't do it? Absolutely. There is evidence to suggest here that the Roosters are not the same team come finals with that added pressure. I think we're a side that's more than capable of competing and we have only improved since our round five uh, loss. Do you have any keys to victory or any anything that's really standing out for you in this one at this stage? I think what's standing out to me right now is just looking at the Eels from last year. Like I never realised mm. to the full extent of what you just said, but yeah, they didn't win a game for the first one, two, three, four, four weeks, and then beat the Broncos and the Roosters consecutively, and then lost to the Knights by a big margin on the grand final. So, uh, yeah, they won that one game in round five, then won the semi-final, and then got into the grand final and got pumped. 
but they'd lost four games straight. That's insane of a stat to actually look at there. Mm. Look, I think that, yeah, keys to victory in this game, man, is just to come in and realize that we have an opportunity of the upset. We have an opportunity to knock off the favorites of the competition. The Roosters, you know, they're a team that has has been around for uh, since the inception of the competition. Obviously, we're still second fiddle to the Broncos for a very long time alongside the Dragons and the Warriors. But the Roosters were always still one of the, pretty much the ones competing with the Broncos early days. Uh, yeah, look, I think that I, I'm very happy with our backline, man. Ivanya Politi versus Corbin Baxter. I'm taking Politi. The wingers of Mia Wood and Jamie Fressard versus Karina Brown and Destiny Menosuna Party. I think that we've got the form there. But Isabel Kelly and Bridie Parker against Jamie Chapman, Noble, and Guthrie. I do think that, especially if you do see Jessica Surtis coming to that centers, I do think I give the, the center pairing there to the Roosters. However, Chapo's been really good form lately, and Noel Williams Guthrie is just so quality as well. So I do think it's more even than people will give it credit for, but something that I don't find even is actually the halves battle. I do think Taryn Aiken and Jocelyn Kelleher are the two that do really separate themselves from the pack right now across the entirety of the competition. I love what Shante Kiriratu is doing and Lauren Brown, but it's just that leadership experience and direction that from Kelleher and Taryn Aiken that make them two of the best halves in the damn well business. So I do give them the advantage there in the, uh, in the halves. Front row forwards. Now, Millie Boyle, you could argue, is the best player in the game. And she's alongside Tuila Fotumuala. However, Shana Mato and Jessica Elliston are the best front row combination in the business. I will not hear a second opinion of that because the stats don't lie. Shana Mato and Jessica Elliston have been incredible in this season. It's been absolutely fantastic. So I'm going to go absolutely bold here. And I'm going to say that as a collective... We beat out their front row four pack despite having Millie Boyle. Because I think Shannon Mato has, this year has been just as good as Millie Boyle. Honestly, the fact is these two have been absolutely balling out. Then you go to the number nine. Keely Davis is very good there. And so is Brittany Bralinardi. I probably do lean with Keely Davis in that regards. Uh, back row wise, Zara Canfield and Shaley Benton versus Olivia Koenig and Otessa Pule. I think that's a bit of a wash there. I think the Koenig and Bent can be very similar in a lot of regards. And I think the Pule and, and Canfield... I think that that's very similar. So I'm going to actually go with a wash there. But I do go Georgia Hale as our captain in that 13 over Keely Joseph, even though Keely Joseph is great. Bench-wise, though, Mai Hilmoana, Amelia Pasicala, Grace Hamilton, and Joely Morris versus uh, Sienna Lefippo, Steffi Hancock, Riley Jorgensen, and Danny Peresi. I think that we have an upset here. I think that going through this team list... I believe we have an upset on the cards at the moment. The form they're showing has the ability. I'm really interested to see if Emily Bass and Fumayano can get back for us. If they can, then I'll absolutely agree with you. We would then have the advantage well, when in this I was, team list. When I was speaking to Emily at the Titans versus Eels game, she said that she was actually probably going to be available for the Raiders game. So if she wasn't available for the Raiders game... I would assume that she will be available for this game. That would be massive. Millie Boyle and Keely Davis, also their first game back after missing last round for the Roosters. So maybe not quite at 100% fitness there, which does give us an advantage there in the middle. Really, really close team lists though. Really, really close. The only part I would disagree with is I actually do give our centres being Noel Williams, Guthrie and Jamie Chapman over how theirs currently sits. But if Jess Sir just returned, then I would have to favour um, them given they would have a Dallium and a golden boot winner in the centers there for me. And I like where you went with your key to victory. there, keeping it mental um, related and just believing that we are in this because we are for me, I'm going to go down. I'm going to put it down to shutting down their defense since beating us by 22 points. They have averaged 35 points. And that includes a game where they actually only scored four points against the Knights. So you take that out and it's more like 40 something points. So for me, defense is the key here. Now, I wanted to put in this stat to show how similarly matched we are defensively. Over the course of the regular season, being nine rounds, we averaged 0.67 more points per game than they did. So less than one point per game is all that separated these sides throughout the regular season. It's not out of the realms of a possibility with an upset here. I'm going to tip it. I'm going to tip Titans by one. Lauren Brown, our field goal queen, kicks <laughs> another. Our specialist, she strikes again. And I also have her as my MVP. I think she'll have two plus try assists. And I think this will be a, a really tight battle. And her experience in, the, in those rep games for Australia will take over. And she'll come up with some big plays. Your final tip, please. And your predicted MVP. 
As I say to you guys every single week, if we have an opportunity to win, I'm going to be tipping us because I believe that we can win. If I believe we're going to win, I'm going to absolutely tip them. And, and I do think that we have an opportunity. Again, I understand being on the dogs. And I guess, look, as you said before, if a gun was to your head in that sense, then yes, you're going to, to, to say that, look, it's, it's probably the Roosters. However... I do believe that an upset could happen here. I genuinely back our team in. I will say by Titans by four. I think that, look, one to four, same old thing. And I think that everyone, obviously, when they think about a close game, will immediately think about a one-pointer and a field goal. But sometimes you can have just as close a game and it be four points rather than one, six points rather than one. It's it's basically the same scoreline in a way across that. So I will go with the four-pointer there. I'd say that if we're going to see... You know, someone really stand up in this game. I do think it's going to have to come from Lauren Brown in our halves to really go up against Jocelyn Kelleher and Taryn Aikam. You know, Shante Kitaratu is going to do what she needs to do from that 5-8, provided Lauren Brown gives her that experience. Because that was the issue with Sienna Lefipo and Shanta Kitaratu when they were together. The experience wasn't there as a collective. Now she's got Lauren Brown. I think that Lauren Brown is the key to our halves. Lauren Brown will be the key to our spine. And I think that we, we all know our forwards are going to do what they need to do. You know, Shanta Mato, Jessica Elliston, Zara Canfield, Shaley Ben, Georgia Hale, they're going to do everything that we expect of them. And in regards to the back line, they get opened up by the halves at the end of the day. So I think that Lauren Brown has to have an MVP-style performance here. I'll say uh, Titans by four points, and uh, gee whiz, we're looking at a grand final. Can you imagine the Broncos win that grand final in the women's? Could you imagine that? Gee whiz, we had a bolter against them earlier on this season. Imagine playing the Broncos in a grand final in the women's. I would fly up just to Marchand Caxton Street with you again. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Uh, but yeah, final word on our girls before we move on to the Q Cup grand final. Please, Titans fans, get behind a team here who genuinely can bring home the first ever silverware in professional rugby league to the Gold Coast, to our home, our region that we love so much. The odds makers don't believe in us. We are, and I know not everyone's into punning, so I'll keep this short. The Roosters are at $1.70, less than even money. They've got the Knights at three twenty-five, dollars Broncos at 8 who we finished above on the ladder, and, and us at $9.00. They don't believe in us. The other fans yeah. don't believe in us. We need to believe. But you know what? The Eels, they know how to beat the Panthers in the men's. Both times in the regular season this year, last year, every year. But guess what? When it comes to the crunch, they can't beat the big dogs. And guess what? Let's emulate that Penrith mentality and let's be the big dogs this week and say, you might have beat us in the regular season, but gee whiz, you're not doing it when it counts. I love it. Different ball game come finals. Final point, go the women. We cannot wait. Let's move around the grounds. Let's go to the Queensland Cup, Host Plus Cup Grand Final. It was, of Don't course, stop me already, Brisbane Don't stop. Be, uh, be the Burley Bears. And our Bears lost. And I know no. if, you, if you didn't watch this game, you're probably wondering how we were so dominant and on form we should have won this game. But we lost 18-22. to 22. And I've got to be honest, I was right into this game. Almost as if it was a Titans fan. I screamed so loud at one point, my two-month-year-old child in front of me genuinely like <laughs> jumped in the air and I felt so bad. Uh, was that the I Tony really... Francis try? Yeah, that, I, I think it was, yeah. The one where Corey Thompson flicks it back in and he, he, he gets oh, the intercept? Oh, yeah. Oh, that was, uh, that was unbelievable. Slater. 2008 Tri Nations or World, <laughs> whatever it was. Esh. Oh man, you got to remind me of that. I was at, yeah. I was in attendance for that. The really? only World Cup final I've ever been at. Now Australia has only lost one World Cup mm -hmm. in history, and it was that one, and I was there. <laughs> it was at Suncorp Stadium. Gee whiz, I'm I'm muting my microphone. I don't want to talk about it. But it's one of those moments that if you're a footy fan, you will never forget seeing that. Um, look, I think the reason I was so passionate and so into this was I just really wanted to see our young Titans players there on Grand Final Day in the state championship, building up that experience for us in the future. Now, we won't go through our Titans players one by one like we do most weeks uh, and review their form. There's no football next week for them, unfortunately, so we don't see too much value in that. Now, typically, I let you go first, but I've got to get some things off my chest in this one. I thought the Bears were extremely unlucky with the officiating, to be blunt and honest. And I could go down that path into great detail, but out of respect to the Tigers and to respect their grand final and premiership, 
I will say the Bears did hurt themselves as much as anything. Outside of Kinney, that entire spine lacked composure in the big moments. Don't want to single out any players, but there was a moment where Guy Hamilton, all he had to do as the halfback was pass to Kinney, and genuinely there was a three-on-one overlap. He would have scored himself or set up another try assist, and we would have won the game there. Instead, he puts in the kick to no one. And so I wanted to see, did I see that wrong? Am I being too harsh? 86% completion, 55% possession, five line breaks to one, 40 tackle breaks to 27, more run meters, more post-contact meters, and less missed tackles. It, like they gave themselves the opportunities in this game. The spine, excluding Kinney. I do not want to hear any Kinney slander ever again. Uh, not that there ever was, but I just don't want to hear it ever now. They just lacked execution. Uh, did you see it that way as well, or you gonna think? Are you gonna go more down the path of the, some of the really bad officiating calls we saw? Oh, go down the path of the stupid <laughs> yeah. damn well calls that we saw, man. Look, I mm. do agree with you in regards to you know that the guy Hamilton situation right at the end there. I do think you pass that. We probably have a much better opportunity to score, and I think that it's just less of a risk play as well. Even though it is a very risky situation, so I do get it. I do think, however, that. This one was a really debatable one for me because, yes, the last, especially especially the last 10 minutes of that game was pretty poorly officiated. And there was a whole community of people who do watch the Host Plus Cup who weren't Bears fans, who were just general NRL fans or rugby league fans saying that was pretty awful. Like, that was awful refereeing that last 10 minutes. Like, there was five reports on reports of the Brisbane Tigers with no bins, and then they finally get a bin in, like, the last 10 seconds, and he lets, like, 30 to 40 seconds go off the clock, and that's exactly what they wanted. And there should have been multiple bins. And, look, at the end of the day, yes, the Bears should have done more, and they didn't look like the dominant team from the outset. However, I do think that originally I thought Brisbane Tigers were coming to this game to be aggressive, and I thought that they were going to be, you know, really in the face, but I thought this was a next level in this game. Like, I thought, I don't usually come out and say that a team is grubs. Like, people say it about the Storm and the NRL, or they say it about, I guess, the Roosters at times. They've said it about the Rabbitohs. But for me, like, I genuinely think that was one of the more grubby performances that I've seen from a team in a very long time. At, at every stage of that game, the Brisbane Tigers were either looking like they wanted to have a fight, they were really getting down at tackles, we were seeing injuries, we were seeing on reports, we weren't even seeing penalties from them, and, and we weren't seeing any kind of sin bin to that last 10 seconds or so. So, although I do understand we could have done more, we should have done more, could have, would have, should have, didn't, I get that, f that factor. However, I do feel at the end of the day, and I agree, I was really passionate about this game. I was on stream doing this one. I didn't think I would have as much passion as I did. But when Tony Francis got that intercept, like what a performance from Tony Francis. What a performance from Keanu Kinney. Um, you know, Kia Perre was doing a great job as well. I did want to see a little bit more out of Kenny Mamalo, though. I, I, I know that every time he catches the ball, he kind of goes down straight away. I would rather him do his tough run backs, but I don't know if he knows. I don't think he, I don't know if he's ever, and this is what a comment we got on the stream. Someone said, I don't know if he's ever realized how big he actually is, like Ken Mamalo, and how much, like, sheer power he actually has. And I kind of noticed it in this game. 2018 was a different story, but in this game, he just didn't seem to have that same kind of oomph running back, which we know that he can do. Um, and yeah, look, I think that overall, this this Bears team, I would have loved to have, uh, have seen them lift the trophy up, but there was a vast amount of factors that went into it, some being of their own fault, and then others also being just simply... I don't believe the officiating was 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 fair enough. There was a really nasty tackle by the Tigers, not intentional, but I thought it was a hip drop nature. Was it on? Do, do you know the players? I know. I think it was players. Vaka was Sikaheli, like, wasn't it? I thought it was him. Yeah, that's who I thought it was. I thought it was fifteen uh, with a knee completely came out. So I think that was with roughly ten minutes to go. In your opinion, should the Tigers have been down one man for that dangerous tackle? I, well, they didn't even give a penalty, for starters. There was no on report. There was nothing. So, um, you know, and, and I did say this on the stream at the time. People were... You, I think you might have come in and said this on the yeah. stream. Um, and there was I a had to say it to people, someone. Well, yeah, no, exactly. Uh, well, that's the whole good thing about the streams. But, you know, I, I remember a few people saying it, but the, the injury was so gruesome that I didn't really want to watch it. So I went back and watched it, and I still, like, flinched at the, the viewing of it. So... I can't really have a great say on that. However, considering there were so many people saying like what you said and what they're, they're saying as a whole, that it should be a bin. One of the guys was even saying this could be a send-off. So 
I'll agree with the the large majority that yes. Well, I think in in my experience with how sin bins have uh, sorry hip drop tackles have been handled with sin bins this year, what seems to constitute the sin bin is when the hips leave the ground, they're facing toward the ground, and the player's weight and entire pressure is going in that direction, the hip in a dropping motion towards the ground, and that absolutely occurred over the player's knee, which was then as you said gruesomely injured in one of the Worse than the injuries I've seen since Boothies, if I'm absolutely honest. Uh, I thought, although completely accidental, it was so dangerous that it should have been a sin bin. You just can't be doing that on a football field ever. At the end of the day, man, I think that, look, I, I know the Burley Bears did lose, but at, at the end of the day, the Bears are also going across to the Broncos next season. Now, I do want to, I did want to see them win, and I'm, I'm still, I used to play for, as a Burley junior, like early, early days of my life, and I'll always have love for Burley, man, but... Uh, with that being said, they're now going to see Keanu Kinney probably go to Tweed. You know, Tony Francis, uh, I, I, we need to see him get re-signed. Uh, Kemma Marlowe will go to Tweed. Isaac Fatsul Malo will go to Tweed. Uh, Jacob Alec will go to Tweed. Vaka Sagaheli and also Josiah Pahulu will go to Tweed, right? So uh, unless we get that Titans host plus cup team in, that I think is not until 2025. But it'll be interesting to see how the Bears do go because obviously they will get the Broncos players in. But... The Broncos do have their plays in other teams, and we've beaten pretty much all those teams. The, the Brisbane Tigers are actually the Melbourne Storm. I am happy for Corey Thompson, though. Corey Thompson getting that win as a fullback was great, and he'll be playing on grand final day, which I don't know if Corey Thompson's ever done. Uh, did he play for the Bulldogs team in 2012? 2014. Yeah, on the wing. Yep. Yeah. Yep, so he returns there in his final season in NRL. Um, look, I gave a negative for Guy Hamilton, the Bears halfback before. I know he's not a Titans contracted player, but I will say he finishes this year with 33 try assists. The next best was Jack Ahern with 24. So whilst I am being critical there, I will say it was a great season by him. Whilst we're on stats, Tony Francis led the Q Cup for tries with 21, uh, equal with his teammate and centre, Sammy. And he led the competition in post-contact metres. You know what was funny metres. about that? Just, just mm-hmm. quickly, you know what's funny about that is that in that game, I think uh, Tony had one more try than Sammy Sawalima, and in the game we saw Tony score two, and then I think like Sam- Sawalima scored one. Yeah, Sawalima scored one, and then that tied them again, and it was whoever scored yeah. next would actually go to the top. No, sorry, Sammy Sawalima was above him by one try, and then Tony scored those two tries. Sammy then scored that try to tie it, and then Tony obviously scored that try in the 64th minute. So it was a really good battle throughout the game for who was going to get that top try scorer. Absolutely, it was. And I'm just checking now. Francis, did he end up getting the hat-trick, or did he fall one short? Was one disallowed? He, he got the hat-trick. He was very close to getting four. Yeah, that's right. I remember there was either he, he did get the hat-trick, or he almost got four. Um, and, and one more word on Tony Francis. Only one player had more run meters than him this year, and that's Jordan Pereira who um, we know from the NRL, he had 100 more metres across... No, sorry, only 40 more metres across the whole season than Tony Francis, who's yet to debut. So a remarkable season where he's second in run metres, first in post-contact metres, over 20 tries and equal first at 21. And I'm just going to say, the last time we saw a young Titans player scored 20-plus tries in the Q Cup, they went on to break the Titans' record for most tries in a single season, being a low Fianna Khan prayer this season for us. I want to go back to Kenny momentarily. He picks up the Duncan Hall medal, which is the equivalent of the Clive Churchill in the NRL. They had him for two try assists at first. The website has him for one now, but I'm giving him two. He had two try assists, nine tackle breaks. That was 11 tackle breaks post game and 264 meters. Tony Francis with a hat trick. I'm extremely proud of those two boys in particular. And I think they absolutely put themselves in frame for a huge preseason with the Titans. And, and we'll continue to push for a jersey throughout that 2024 season. Really, really proud of them. Let's go to our, well, let's continue rather, our review. And last week we reviewed all of our outside backs. If you haven't heard that yet, that's available on the last podcast, probably about 40 minutes in. And we're going to review forwards this week under the same criteria as last week, where a forward is rated 0 to 10, but based on the opportunities they had this year, what we mean by that is someone with limited opportunities, such as Jacob Arlick, his seven would not be the same as someone like Tino, who's our captain. We expect a lot more played majority of the year. So I'm going to kick us off with Chrissy Randall. For me, I'm extremely proud of Chris. He came into this side as a backup hooker for depth purposes only, and he cemented himself as one of our best middle forwards 
Nine and a half out of ten. I'm going right up there to kick us off. What are you going to give Chrissy Boy? Chrissy Randall. Chrissy Randall, what a man. He is a cult hero of this club. As I've said to you guys before, like we had a conversation at one of the members' nights, and he was just really, really... A, he's a great bloke. Like I speak to him all the time, but like when I spoke to him, he was just so desperate to be able to play footy. That's what he wants to do with his life. He just wants to play footy, first grade footy, consistent first grade footy. And this year, he was very, very good at what he did. He could come in as a front rower. He could come in as a nine. He could come in as a back rower. He'd come as a lock. He's the perfect bench utility. And going forward, it's no disrespect to say, I don't want him starting. I want him on the bench as our as our forwards utility. I think that we're one of the few teams that can actually have a real designated backs utility and a forwards utility there, and then you get like a front row forward and a back row or a front row forward and a front row forward. Like we've got a really good uh, mix of talent in our bench coming 2024. So yeah, look, Chrissy Randall for me, nine and a half out of 10, was not expecting him to be as good as he was this year. I don't think anybody was. No one really looked at him too in-depthly at the Knights and everyone was like, oh man, why did you get rid of Greggy Matsu? Well, now you understand why we got rid of Greggy Matsu. He's been a beast of a play, Chris Randall, nine and a half out of 10. I always have my eye on Chris Randall after he broke the record for most tackles on debut in the NRL. I think he had 61 or 63. I knew he was a great defender. I didn't know he had this versatility in his game. A lot of people talk, Jaden Campbell, AJ Brimson, Keanu Kinney, who's our fullback next year? It's Chris Randall with the amount of versatility. You've got to have his name in there. You've got to put his name in the hat. <laughs> a versatile player that we love. Let's go to David Fafita. For me, the first note I've got is what a season. Under immense external pressure in the media from other fans saying he's overrated. Even Titans fans weren't entirely happy with Dave coming into this year. In my opinion, the best back row in the comp in 2023. Couldn't have done much more. I couldn't be happier. So I'm going to go a 9.7 out of 10 for Dave. Uh, I, I never give 10s for our transparency to our viewers. I think no one's ever perfect, so you can't really give a 10. Uh, but Dave was close to doing as much as he could for us this year. So 9.7 out of 10, what are you going to give Dave? <laughs> You've given a 9.7. You've changed it from a 9.5 to a 9.7. Okay, yeah, I like what well, May as well just bump it up to a 9.9 at this point. 9.9? <laughs> I'll go 9.9. 9.9, there you It's going to increase. Yep, yeah, now it's going to be 9.99999. There you go. But look, yeah, David Feeder obviously need to have a bounce back year. Not even too much. Like last year, it was a really overrated bad year. Like it wasn't as bad as people made it out to be. It was kind of like it, he'd set up such a... a um, Expectation for himself. Yeah, lofty expectations. And then didn't hit it alongside the entirety of the club in 2022. And everyone was like, oh no, he's not good enough, this and that. And then this year happened and he's just shown you what kind of absolute talent he has. I believe he's been the best back row in the competition this year at an NRL level. For some reason, it doesn't really seem to translate into origin. It does with Tonga and it does with NRL. But for some reason, origin, it just kind of goes amiss. And they're just not utilizing him correctly. But for me... Dave Fafita, 9.5 out of 10 as well. I think that the only way I would ever give a 10 for this, you know, for our players is if we're making a preliminary final and beyond. Yeah, that's probably fair, to be honest. I mean, oh, it's absolutely fair. You probably couldn't say someone had a perfect season if their side didn't finish um, in the top eight for any team, really. So it shouldn't be any exception to our Titans ratings. Let's go to Aaron Clark, someone you're really close with off the field. Really handy player in the middle, I thought, this year. Played a great link role. Uh, when we talk link roles in rugby league now, we always go to the Isaiah Yo's, Patrick Carrigan's. He performs that similar role to us. I thought he showed great aggression and defense, and he played with a lot of pride in the jersey. That's what I love most about his season. So I'm going to go 8 out of 10. I agree. I, I love Ez. Ez is just a phenomenal bloke. He does absolutely, undeniably love this club and, and wants to give everything that he can. He's a proud man. He he loves his family. And the way he loves his family is also the way that he loves this club. And I'm really proud of the man that he has become with us. Now, look, I don't think that this year he had that same X factor as he had last year. I think that this year was a real kind of mixed year because we didn't really necessarily know if we were playing him as a 13 or Isaac Lee in the 13, and then we kind of mixed him up in the in the for uh, in the on the bench as well. So I don't think that this was as his best year. So I'm going to give him a seven and a half. But everything about this guy does show that he could be our 13 next year in 2024 under Desi. 
Uh, you know, he's still got age on his side. And again, the passion that he shows this team is absolutely brilliant. So I'll go seven and a half, but I love what it does for the club. I loved uh, the moment when the Roosters were up against us and Jared Maria Hargraves was getting stuck into our forward pack and it didn't matter about the score. Aaron, sc- Aaron scored that try and straight away looked for Jared Maria Hargraves to say like, don't care what the score is, don't disrespect our club like that. And I really love that moment and how he stood up. Let's go to Isaac Liu now. Now, this is one of my lower ratings. I don't have the most positive to say, so I'll, I'll go to you first for Isaac Liu. What rating are you going to give Isaac? Uh, wow, okay. You said just throw me on the bus. Yeah, wow. Basically. Thanks, man. Basically. Look, I, I know Isaac is the kind of guy that a club does need. He is, he's very quiet. He's called the Iceman as his nickname. And... I know that Isaac is what this club needs in regards to stability. He will do everything that he possibly can. But I do think that it hasn't necessarily translated into this club at the moment. I don't think that we're I don't think that he is necessarily what this club needs on the field in a playing sense. But a mental sense, absolutely. If I could say, you know what, Isaac, I'm not going to actually play today, but I want you to be around this team going into the future to really, you know, um, just keep them cool, calm, and collected. I absolutely would. I think that he really has that ability to to get into the players and for the players to respect him without him actually saying an unbelievable amount. So, look, I, I, I'm going to probably give him... I'm going to give him a five and a half... Because there were some moments in the season where he did... There was a couple of games, and I can't really point them out to you. I think it might have been... It might have been the cows... No, there was a game around the cows anyway, but he did have a couple of good games here and there. But overall, it was a bit far and few between. So I will go a five and a half based on those couple of good games. But yeah, look, I think that it's time that we do look towards our 13. And I agree with Isaac Liu. He, he averaged 85 meters this year, which we probably need a little bit more from a middle forward. I think he regressed a little bit this season, but he is 32 now. Um, so we do see players, once they get to that other side of 30, start to go down a little bit stats-wise. Look, I, I'm not sure he played bad this year. I'm just not sure he played good. Um, there was a lot of times where he was doing something for us, but probably just not enough to what we need. Um, I'm going to go five and a half out of 10, but I do, like, I hate making these comments right now because I really do respect Isaac and what he's done for our club. So I feel horrible saying that, giving such a low rating. Um, it's not a reflection of him at a personal at all. And for me, he's what James Tamo was for the Panthers in 2020. They needed James Tamo to get to the point of success, just like we needed Isaac. But whether he is there into the future um, is probably a question for our club executives to make a decision on. Let's go to Isaac for us or Malawi. For me, came off the bench a few times this year with limited impact. Um, still very young, chipping away at it, but probably didn't show enough at the NRL level to convince me he's in our 17 next year. Um, probably still needs to keep chipping away at it in reserve grade. I'll go a five and a five and a half out of 10 for Isaac. What rating are you going to give him? I think I'm going to agree there with five and a half. And I, it really don't, I really do hate obviously having to give these low yeah, ratings for players because like, I don't want like uh, these guys know that I respect them. I love them and we respect them and love them. And as a club, we're always getting behind them. And, and, and look, as I say on the, the tier rankings, so on BKR sport on YouTube, every single year I do a tier rankings and we, we usually do it as well as um, uh, with one video. But we go through each and every single player in the NRL in a certain position and rank them. I do it with another content creator. And Clark, you know, I've done it before and we'll do it probably again next year. But, you know, when we rank them poorly, I feel like it's a bit of a motivating sense if they listen to this to use it and say, you know what, let's prove them wrong. And we want to be proven wrong. I never want to be right about a bad rating with our club. I really, and it's not a bad rating. A bad's like a two, like a three. You know, so they're still doing what they need to do. Isaac is young. I didn't see the amount of impact that I wanted to this season, but there is still time for him to change it around. So I will go the five and a half. I do agree with you there. Not enough impact yet, but please prove us wrong next year and get into that 17. Yeah, keep chipping away with it. Absolutely. Still very young there. Jacob Barlick, another young player who had extremely limited opportunity to the disappointment of a lot of fans. But when we did see him, and keeping in mind his rating uh, to become a 10 is much lower ceiling than others because of that limited opportunity, I was actually really impressed. I thought he's shown a lot of X Factor. 
and a lot of upside. And you do need attacking forwards in the modern game. So I'm going to go a seven and a half out of 10 for Jacob. But I understand why others might disagree with that. Do you disagree with it? No, I, I actually would bump it up to an eight. I think that Jacob Barlick, when he got his opportunity this season, though it was extremely limited, I do think that he showed enough of what we need from a guy like him. He can play the 13. Obviously, he's been killing it Burley Bears-wise in the back row all season, but he won't be able to get into the back row with the Titans. But you could think of him as our future 13, especially with now, you know, Isaac Liu being on the outer, Aaron Clark being there, maybe Jacob puts his hand up there for that 13. Uh, you know, you, you do have him potentially as a, as a bench uh, depth role there in regards to the back row. Uh, look, I think that Jacob Arley, he knows how to play on the big stage too. He's played for Papua New Guinea in the Rugby League World Cup. I think, yeah, in last year's one, he'll be playing in the Pacific Championships this time around too. I can't see a better 13 than Jacob Arley from Papua New Guinea. So he's got the experience there too. I think that, yeah, I was excited from what I saw. He played in the centers at one point as well. Uh, and uh, I think that for a debut season where he only got really limited opportunity, I think he showed that he can be a quality player. But as you said, it is a lot easier to give a higher ranking for players like this because we got such a limited time. But again, show quality in that limited time. I agree. And I think when we say players didn't quite make our 17 next year or are pushing for it, you, you, I think we have to stop and consider. Tino and Mo would likely be our front row of semi barrels at hooker. Our back row is likely going to be Bo Firmer and Dave. Our lock is... I would say at this stage going to be Aaron. We know Jaden Campbell needs to be in the 14, if not at fullback, or potentially Kinney. If Brimo Sam, essentially what I'm saying is the 14 and 15 are probably going to be a combination of Jaden Campbell or Keanu Kinney and Chris Randall. So it really only leaves two spots there. One of those is going to be Jamin Joloff, absolutely, who will be our next player. So really, when we say they're not now 17, there's only one other spot. And there's so many players, you know, there's uh, Cleese Haas, Joe Stimson, Jacob Barlick, Isaac, Liu, so many players that are pushing for that final spot that it's really not a negative at all to say you're not quite now 17 next year in our opinion just yet. Jamin Jolla, for me, the quite achiever of our forward pack, when he was out injured, it's shown. I really think it's shown. And it probably didn't show to the point where fans were like, yep, we miss Jamin Jolla. But if you look at the stats, the post-contact meters, the work through the middle, it's shown. Uh, 8 out of 10 for me, but he did unfollow me on Instagram, so I'm demoting it to a 7 out of 10. <laughs> Jimmy, I love you, and you've broken my heart. Uh, if my content sucks, just tell me. You Your don't need to unfollow, sucks. but... Yeah, it must. But <laughs> no, Jimmy's, nah, Jimmy's a great bloke, man. Jimmy and I speak all the time. We we talk at games, we talk at training, we talk on Instagram, and whatnot. But he doesn't even follow me, so you I'm know, um, yeah, I, I, I don't know, <laughs> Jimmy. I'm gonna put this on my uh, on my on the Instagram, mate. Where's the followers for the big fella? Cross big post it to me. Uh, yeah, cross post it. Uh, but yeah, and look. <laughs> you know what? We'll try and collaborate with him too. You, <laughs> me, and him. If you like, what? What's going on here? But yep, look, yep. but besides that, people don't recognize that Jimmy Dolph actually has very similar stats to Tino, but doesn't get the commendations for it because of the fact that he's not Tino. Jamin is such a pivotal role in this club. He is such a pivotal guy. And we, we saw that when he was a part of the team, we did obviously find the most success, especially when you can interchange Tino, Mo, and Jimmy are the three of them all together there. Um, he's a really quality player, man. I am going to give him a straight up eight. Uh, I think that the only reason he's not a nine is because I'm Unfortunately, the injuries did cruel him in 2023, which was a real tough one there for, for Jimmy Jolliffe. But overall, great bloke, loves his club, will give everything for this club. This man will give everything for the Gold Coast Titans. Can the, <laughs> can the boys get a follow, mate. We love you. Um, and to close off this video on Instagram right now, if you're watching it, this is from the Gold Coast Titans Frontline Podcast. Check us out on Spotify, Apple, and YouTube. <laughs> Let's go to Joe Stimson. A bit like Isaac Liu for me, where he did his job a lot of the weeks. Didn't quite offer that additional that you get from a Fafita, a Tino, etc. I do believe, and I don't know if this is confirmed, uh, he had a shoulder injury early on this year that he played through for the whole season. Now, if that is true, I'm going to give him a 6 out of 10 because that does show a lot of great heart to play on through an injury for the entire season. Fill in the middle, fill in the back row. So 6 out of 10 for Joe. Uh, for my rating, what are you going to give Stimo? For me, man, I think that uh, Joey Simpson, he was, he tried his best. He tried his definite best. He didn't, he wasn't able to do what everyone would have loved him to have done. But since the preseason, I've been saying that Joe Simpson is a guy that can really perform as a bench 
rotation prop. I think that he can really do a good job in regards to that. Unfortunately, he, most of the time he was in the back row with the injury to Bowie Firma, uh, and we hadn't really included Cleese Haas just yet. We hadn't seen the likes of Jacob Barlick or Isaac Fasil Malawi, uh, but Cleese Haas has obviously come in, and we'll get to him in a second. But yeah, look, for me, I, I will go with six there. I think that he's got the heart, man. He does try his absolute best, but he does have a limited amount of gas in the tank for mine, uh, but will absolutely throw everything he's got at it. So I'll say six, and t six out of ten. Next player is Joseph Funa, and I don't like giving this rating, but i got to be honest. I mean, I'm sure people would not enjoy the podcast if I came on here and just lied every week. So let me be honest. I didn't think he offered quite enough in the minutes we saw him this year. Um, I didn't see too much upside or potential to his game moving forward. And I probably thought in terms of the NRL requiring an offload, requiring a late step, a quick play the ball, probably didn't show that this year. So I am only going to go a 4 out of 10 for Joe. Um, but if this is the last time or the last season we've seen with the Titans, I do uh, want to say thank you for your service for our club for the years you were with us. What rating are you going to give Joe? Yeah, we love you, Joey Funa. Uh, did obviously score that try against the Melbourne Storm. You know, a good friend of ours, Rhonda, always loves to talk about that try uh, against the Melbourne Storm there for Joey. But look, yeah, it wasn't unfortunately a great uh, a great year uh, in regards to making an impact for the team. And look, I'm gonna I'm gonna pretty flat out agree with you there on the four out of ten. I don't really want to vote him any lower. I do think that he still you know worked hard for this team, uh, but it just didn't necessarily come together in 2023. So I w I would agree with you. Yes, absolutely. Let's. Uh, let's move on to Cleese Haas. This is a player for me that improved with every single minute we saw him this year. And the upside and the potential is absolutely there. Um, I think we saw that against the Panthers with that incredible first try there. For me, he probably has cemented himself as that final place in the 17 for us next year. And I do want to see more from Cleese. So I'm going to go a 7.5 out of 10. What rating have you got for Cleese? I just want to ask you a quick question before I get on with what I'm saying. If, if we were doing pain Haas right now, what would you give him for the 2023 season? Genuinely? Mm. Jeez, you'd have to go with 9.9 .9 out of 10. I don't think as a prop, he could have done too much more, right? Yeah, I love that because Cleese is the best Haas in the business, right? So that means we're going to have to give him a 10 there because Cleese is the best Haas in the business, baby. You know, this is the money maker. Cleese Haas, he knows what he's damn well doing. He's got a good damn well head on his shoulders. He loves what he's doing. He's coming up strong. Um, look, I think he's had a good season. Look, I, I did see a little bit of criticism for him in regards to, I guess, meters made and whatnot. But overall, I think that he did a really good job to come in a replacement of Bowie Firma and especially with the likes of of Joe Stimson, who we weren't necessarily seeing what we wanted to see. He came in as a youngster and, and did what he needed to do. So, look, as a whole, I would agree with you. I would say, you know what? I'm pretty happy to actually say 8 out of 10. I'm pretty happy for it because I do see the potential and the talent from this year. Uh, a lot to be worked on still. Still need to see some things in, in more more effort in certain areas. But overall, he's the best house in the business, and it's not debatable. And I will say for Cleese, and I won't go into the specifics, but he did have a lot of turmoil in his life away from the field this year, where he was forced with pain to become the man for his family and provide for his younger siblings. So um, no doubt he faced a lot off the field, a lot of adversity, and continued to show up for us. So I've got a lot of love for Cleese and what he brought to our club last year, and will continue to do so in future years. Cruz Leeming, a player we're losing now, I don't think he was really handy. I thought he was a great attacking hooker. I do think he was probably surplus to our needs and our requirements with hookers with Randall and Verrills there. Uh, and I think at this stage of his career, he's too good for Q Cup. So I respect his decision to go home. But I'm honestly going to give him a 7 out of 10. I think he was a really good attacking hooker for us. Did you see it that way as well? I agree. I think that Cruz was a necessity though because, you know, Sammy Verrills had gone down and he was down for like eight, nine weeks at the start of the year. And then all we had was Chrissy Randall. And at the time, we didn't really think Chrissy Randall was that much. We thought he was that depth player, but we didn't think he was going to be that unbelievable. Uh, obviously worked out, but Cruz, he, and, and Chrissy Randall then went down injured, remember? So mm -hmm. Cruz had to start in the number nine for us and look, had his mistakes. I think that he did learn the pace of the game, and I did think that he did everything that he could whilst he was here. I don't knock him for his efforts. I don't knock him for the achievements that he tried to accomplish here. Um, and I think that he loved the Gold Coast, you know? And um, yeah, look, I, I really am happy for him uh, that he was welcomed here so nicely and people really took him on. And, and honestly, man, like if we didn't have... 
If we didn't have a guy like Chrissy Randall as our depth, I would actually like to see Cruz stick around. I wouldn't have even had a problem with him if he did stick around. At one point, I was thinking, oh, maybe not. But towards the end of the season, I actually really liked him. So I wish nothing but the best for him. I believe he's going to Wigan up there near Manchester. Uh, it should be a, a good time for him up there. He knows England. He's from England. And uh, best, of luck in the, best of luck in the Super League. But I will go with a 7.5 out of 10. Love that rating and love what Cruz bought for us. And uh, we'd always welcome him back if he ever wants to come back and live on the beautiful Gold Coast. Let's go to the main man, Moeki Fotuaka. An insane season that saw him not only recall, but realistically force his way back into the Maroons lineup. Clearly our best or second best middle forward every single week. So I'm going to go a 9.5 slash 9.7 out of 10 again for Here Mo. Here we go again. Uh, <laughs> what are you going to give, Mo? Listen, I'm going to have to give him a 9.5 out of 10 as well. I think that Mo Aiki Fodawaka had a really good bounce back year as well. I think that last year was a little bit stagnant. Um, and maybe even the year before was kind of. But that was still a big year for him. And this year has been even bigger. Like This has probably been his biggest of his career. Uh, but it just hasn't been as well received by the general and Republic because of the team performances. But you watch, if this team is at the top end of the table, people will really start to look at the guys like Mawaki Fodawaka more. They'll start to look at guys like Jimmy Joloff more, you know, and, and all these this talent. But unfortunately, the results as a whole push us down to the, you know, they're looking more so at some guys at the Broncos who aren't actually that great, but because they're at the top, they get that little bit extra attention, right? So, um, yeah, I think the Mike can find a way nine and a half out of ten, brilliant season and uh, brilliant performance. Yeah, i got to be honest, Mo, I think he's off contract 2024 at this stage. Mm -hmm. I'll be shocked if sides like the Storm and the Roosters and the Rabbitohs and these big teams don't come calling for him because um, he is one of those talents that's kind of hidden because we are one of the smallest teams in the league. Uh, but make no mistake about it, he, just like the Rabbitohs kind of cottoned on, hey, we're losing Sam Burgess, let's grab Jai Arrow. I really hope we lock down Mo. But is quickly. Jai, Jai, is he a Brisbane boy? Or did he live a bit of his life in Sydney as well? Because I know Mo has just been a Gold Coast boy through and through, hasn't he? Yeah, he has. Um, and I think he'll want, he, he's big on family. So I think he will stay with the Titans. But Jai was um, Gold Coast based growing up. So, oh, there you go. Um, I actually um, saw Jai at the UFC and had a good chat to him. And he said he's doing well down there. Um, and I said, well, anyway, catch you later because you're not a Titan anymore. No, I didn't. He's a, he's a good guy. <laughs> he's a really good guy. Uh, let's go to Sammy Verrills, an injury-affected season. Uh, but when he was there, I think he's shown he's a world-class hooker. Maybe not world-class. Maybe I've gone too over the top there. I thought he's shown he's a very classy hooker. Dare I say, when he was healthy, he was better than the man the Roosters piffed him for in Brandon Smith. And I'll stand by that. People can disagree, but I'll stand by it. Um, injuries do remain an issue, though, at this point of his career. I don't think he's seen out a full NRL season due to these injuries. Super tough player, though. 7 out of 10 for me, and that's only due to injuries. What are you going to give, Sammy? Before the season started, I, I agree with you and said that I genuinely believe that Sam Verrills is the most one of... Actually, no, I would say the most underrated player in the NRL, especially in the hooker. I think that he is extremely underrated and I would genuinely put him as a top three hooker when healthy and that is the biggest issue when healthy because unfortunately he's not healthy as much as we would like now I do think I and agree with you that when Sam is good to go he is brilliant like I, I but I'm gonna agree with you on a I'm seven and a ten just because we signed him this year to be, and this is at no fault of Sam Verrills. I'm not having a go at Sammy at all. Like I see him all the time, lovely bloke. Not having a go at Sam at all. It's just the unfortunate curse that injuries do have. And it's the same thing that we saw with Jimmy Jolloff this year. It's the same thing we saw with AJ Brimson. It's the same thing that we even see with uh, Kieran Foran at times, you know. Um, it's it's very unfortunate. Jojo Fafita is another one. We need to see them out there for as long as we possibly can. But unfortunately, the injury, injury curse does really come, you know, and, and hit some players. And Sam Vells is one of them. So I'm going to go 7 out of 10. But under Desi, if he can get his body right and he can really get going next year, I could see him getting a 9.9 .9 out of 10. For sure, I could see him getting a 10 out of 10. Yeah, Lachlan Croak is a player that went to another level. He wasn't even a hooker when Des moved him there. Uh, i got some stats up here. For the, When he was at the Roosters, he played... 48 of a possible 110 uh, rough game, roughly that games there. Um, and for us this year, he played 11 out of 24. Um, so definitely Andrew remains a concern, but 
Um, no fault of his own. Fingers crossed Sammy has a healthy season, his first full one next year. I'll let you go first for the last one we're going to talk about today. Tino for us, Suamala Aoi, our skipper, our leader, our Uso. What rating are you going to give Big Tino? <laughs> Don't ever do that again, Dane. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ever say. <laughs> Man, I thought it was good. <laughs> Uh, Tino would appreciate it, maybe. Yeah, uh, you know what? We'll see. Because guess what? Hello, Instagram again. Um, but <laughs> that was just out. Uh, uh, also, it was like you deliberately tried to put a voice on, like an accent on, and it was just such a softer way out. Uh, also, I don't know what it was, but it was just, it was very funny. But Tino, uh, also, brother, nine point nine out of ten, man. He, he, you couldn't really ask for much more. You know what? I will say nine point five because there is always room for improvement i think that tino knows that every time i i give him commendations you know whether it be in melbourne or after a game or wherever yeah look i it's um it's just one of those ones where he knows that the whole team can be better but as i speak to him all the time about as well he absolutely loves his club and he wants to be he what he's like me and like you and like everyone else he's just another guy who wants to see the community happy and he wants to see our people happy and for Tino uh, it's it's a long road just like all of us but he's willing to put in the fight for it yes he's getting a good chunk of money but the fact of the matter is is that he's earned that deserves it he's got the respect from the fans he's got the respect from the players and when this podcast comes out on Wednesday he's probably just won back to back to back Paul Broughton medals so he deserves it look nine point uh, yeah, 9.5 out of 10. I'm actually going to give Tino a 9.8 out of 10. For me, he was our leader and our best player in almost every single game, week in, week out. And for anyone that would disagree with such a high rating of between 9.5, like you gave him to 9.8, I would just ask the question, genuinely, what more did you want to see from Tino? Um, you know, he was always up there leading our tackle count. He was always up there leading post-contact meters, hit-ups, meters, offloads, tackle breaks, you name it. He was near enough at the top of the stats week in, week out. Um, what about tries, Dane? Down. What about tries? What about tries? No. Well, he wasn't quite up there with the likes of Lockdown. <laughs> exactly right. 9.5. 9.5. There you go. <laughs> uh, that is something the big fella's going to have to work on. But even there, I, I, I swear, every time we were down, he would manage to score in like the last 10 minutes this year as well. So he was pretty good in that area as well. Um, we, we love you, Tino. We love that you love our club. And we appreciate all your efforts across this season. So I'm going to give Tino... Uh, a 9.8 out of 10, my highest rating this year. Before we move on here, I want to throw out here and put up the coach, Jimmy Lenahan. I would like to, to give him a bit of a ranking as well, because I know that this wasn't on the, the sheet. But for me, for Jimmy, I, I think that I absolutely will have to give Jimmy Lenahan a 9 out of 10. Uh, you could even make an argument for 9.5 out of 10. As an interim coach, who's never, he had to take over a massive, massive tumultuous club that had the Tino issues, the David issues in regards to contract, the the halftime fadeaways issue that was not fixed for three years. Well, guess what? Jimmy Lenahan fixed it. It's not an issue for us in the second half anymore. You know, we, um, you know, there is so many things that went into the back end, especially when then he also lost the likes of Sammy Verrills. He lost the likes of Chrissy Randall. Um, he lost Tino for games. He lost all these guys to injury. Uh, Aaron Clark, Isaac Liu, but yet we still remained competitive throughout the back end of the year. The Warriors game, the Panthers game, the, the Storm game. We were still competitive in these games. We beat the Cowboys. We knocked the Cowboys out of their finals hopes, right? So for overall... I've got to give uh, the biggest commendation to Jimmy Lenahan, who I think is a very similar style coach to Desi Hasler. Uh, and I, I think that it's going to be really good times underneath uh, Jimmy alongside Desi. I actually am going to go slightly lower for Jimmy Lenahan. I am only going to give him a 7 out of 10, purely because rugby league is a results-driven business. And there was only the three wins with, I believe, the eight losses this year. But let me break down those games and tell people why it could have been a lot higher rating. So he wins his first ever game as a head coach in the NRL against the Broncos, who were sitting first at the time at the Broncos, Glenn Brown and Suncorp. Amazing. We then go to Canberra and Todd Smith has an MVP performance for the Raiders. <laughs> no, in all seriousness, we were very, very unlucky. No, 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 that was Peter. serious. Yeah, there's no one else seriousness. That was serious. All right. Yeah, let me call it for what it is. That We were very, very <laughs> unlucky in that game. Um, we then lose to the Dolphins and the Eels back-to-back. 
the issue is one week we were penalised for being offside, the next week the opposition team wasn't, and we should have been the ones getting the penalty right in front and kicking two. So either way you want to cut that, slice that cat, we win one of those games there. Um, of course, then we did have the disappointing loss to the Roosters, but we bounced back with a great win over the Cowboys who were riding a seven-game win streak at the time. We then lost to the Warriors. We were a little bit unlucky with that Moeki Fodawake ascending. That was a great opinion. game, though. Like, we performed we can very perform admirably in that game. Yeah, I wasn't even angry that we lost that one. Uh, Sharks game, we lost by 30. We were both at that one. It was disappointing. That was awful. We then went against premiership heavyweights uh, that will actually face off on a prelim this week, Panthers and Melbourne. We competed pretty well for 60 minutes in those games. I wasn't disappointed. And then we finished our season with a win. So, Jimmy, I am only going to give a 7 out of 10, but it was so close to being like an 8.5 or a 9 out of 10. Um, so, yeah, Jimmy Lenahan, awesome coach, really happy he is sticking around. And, um, yeah, whilst I am giving him a relatively low rating, hopefully I've – added some context to how that could have been a lot better a had a few calls gone our way. Smack in the nine. Get around, Jimmy. Yeah, Up the Lenahan, man. Get around, Jimmy. I'm Lennon. really happy he's sticking around. I, I really am. Um, I think he'll be great working with Desi Hasler. All right, guys. At this point of the show, traditionally, we would go into our new question segment. We're going to leave that up for another week because we have gone a little longer than we thought, giving our forwards a rating. Um, the question is available on all Gold Coast Titans fan pages. It's out of all our games in 2023. What was your favorite to watch and why? Go and leave your response to that, and we will read out the ones we like most next week. Until we see you next week, we want to say thank you very much for being here for this episode. We want to say go the Titans, NRLW girls. We're right behind you, and fingers crossed, God willing, we are here to review a Titan side in the grand final next week. And we might even both be there live, to be absolutely honest with you. So I can't wait for this. Go to the Titans NRLW side and over to you, Blaze, to say farewell to our listeners. Yeah, really excited for this week, man. You know, it's going to be a good one there against the Roosters. Again, I think there is an upset on the cards. We have the ability to. We really appreciate you guys listening in. We all obviously know it's off-season for the men's. We've still got the women's game on. Now it's off-season for the Host Plus Cup. Now, guys, we do have players that we're able to bring on throughout the off-season as well. We just obviously got to organize that kind of stuff and... You know, hopefully we can try and get on some of the, the staff as well. So, yeah, it should be a good off-season. Uh, so stick around with us. Uh, and, uh, you know, look, again, stick around with the, this women's team because we have a genuine opportunity. Unfortunately, I won't be able to be there in Sydney this Sunday because I do have one of our fellow frontline members. Uh, he has a wedding on Saturday. So that's down there in Yamba. So I don't know if I'll be able to get to there by then. But I will be streaming live on Big Girl Sport YouTube. So if you want to join uh, join me, if you're not at the game and join me, then you can jump on YouTube if you want to, if you're going to the game. Are you going to the game, Dane? Not this week. I'm going to have a week off with the kids and we'll be going yeah. next week to the grand final. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Well, then you can join us there on the stream as well. But no, we appreciate you guys as always. If you're on YouTube, hit that like button and subscribe. If you're on Spotify, give us a rating. We really appreciate it. If you can give us a five stars review and if you're on Apple, give us a, send us some comments and, and whatnot. It'd be really nice uh, with some with some five stars as well. So we do everything we can to hopefully get you guys, uh, your brains ticking and enjoying the club and loving this community. So we appreciate you as always. But we will see you next time, guys. But guess what? You know what I'm having for dinner this weekend, Dane? Tell me what roast I'm having for dinner chicken. on Sunday. I'm having KFC, roast chicken. baby. Roast chicken. Nine for nine ninety five. <laughs> okay, let's go. <laughs> hey, if we win, stay tuned to my page. There's a roast chicken, chicken uh, cooking tutorial coming live to Clarkie's Rugby League column when we win this week. I love right it. Right after full time. Stay tuned for that, baby. <laughs> Are, Are you actually going to do muscle? that? Are you actually going to do that? Look, I, I am a little bit sporadic sometimes. Stay tuned <laughs> is all I'm going to say. And uh, stay tuned for the grand final next week. We appreciate you all. Thank you very much.